Thank you very much, and I am honored to be here to celebrate with you the great theme of TED Women 2013, Invented Here. And that's exact, yes, Invented Here. And that's what I'm here to speak about today. The here, the present. But I don't feel that we can fully embrace the present until we have focus. And focus is something I happily learned about from President Clinton. I'll never forget that first White House event when I was the director of events. The place was all set. The East Room was the scene of an education event. The stage was ready, the seats were in place. The White House social aides were there to escort guests to their seats. The United States Marine Corps Band, the president's own, had a woodwind quintet playing in the grand foyer on the state floor. Well, I got the participants for that event, took them through the stage, showed them the room, let them know when they'd be speaking, in what order, and where they'd be sitting. Then I tucked them away in the blue room on the state floor, just off the cross hall. Then we were ready. I gave the cue to the Secret Service and the staff to open up the gates, and the guests arrived. They walked in the ground floor. They came up through the grand foyer and took their seats in the East Room. As it got closer to event time, I gave the cue to let the press come on up and take their places. Then the colonel of the U.S. Marine Corps Band brought up the unit for ruffles and flourishes and hail to the chief for that grand entrance. We were in place. We were ready to go, except for one thing. Where was the president? The president was often late. In fact, we called it CST, Clinton Standard Time, which was often late. But finally, when he arrived, I gave him his briefing, walked him into the blue room, introduced him to the other participants. But in that very first event, before I cued the colonel for ruffles and flourishes, because once you hear that dun da da dun da 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 dun da da dun da 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 there's no going back. <laughs> and I said, sir, are you ready? And he looked at me, and he said, Laura, it's showtime. And I thought, showtime? You know, what is the showtime? You know, but hey, better to have him in a good mood than not. And the event went off real well. It was great. Well, later on that afternoon, I was participating in a briefing in the Oval Office. There was a small event that would be going on in the cabinet room next door, but there was some press presence. So after we finished the briefing, we walked through his assistant's office, but before I opened that side door to the cabinet room, I just quietly said to the president, you ready? And he quietly said back to me, it's showtime. And then I realized he wasn't saying it's showtime to be funny. He was saying it's showtime to get into focus to effectively communicate his message at hand for the next 20 minutes, the next hour, the next two hours. And he wasn't late because he was lazy. He was late because like every single one of us, he's a multitasker. Presidents multitask. While I was ready in the East Room that afternoon, he was wrapping up a briefing on national security. Then he's walking down the West Colonnade to the residence where the East Room is, and he gets pulled aside because there's a vote going up on the hill, and he's got to make a few calls. A multitasker. And the showtime reference really put him in the zone. And I thought to myself, hey, if it works for him, maybe it can work for me. The next day, I had another event. This time, it was in the Rose Garden. The seats were all laid out, they were in place, the stage was ready, the flags were flying. But on this day, before I gave the cue to the gate to open up for the guests, I said to myself, Laura, it's showtime. And then I took the notion of all those messages stacked up on my desk and all those phone calls I have yet to return, the meetings later on that afternoon, the events the next day, the state dinner the next month, and my dry cleaning that was still at the cleaners in the last five weeks. I just took all of those thoughts, all of those worries, all of those items, and I put them aside for that next hour. And even though the event went well the day before, this event was even better. 
I enjoyed it more. I gave more. I got back more. I learned from it. It made me better. So then I thought, maybe I should put some of the showtime into my own life. I'm sure like all of you, there have been times where we walk into a family gathering. We're on the phone as we walk in. It sits next to us as we're in conversation at the table. Well, I decided the next time I walked into my family's house and I went back to visit, when I crossed that threshold, I said silently to myself, it's showtime. And I left that phone in my jacket and hung it up, sat down at the table, and I had better conversation. I was present. Nowadays, when I'm on the phone with a client, I take everything else that's on my desk, and I just put those papers to the side. I either put their website on the computer in front of me or just nothing. Because I tell you, we've all been on those conference calls, and you know who's on the other end playing Angry Birds. <laughs> it's apparent. And then a few years ago, before I took the stage at a large conference, they made some announcements before my introduction. And they said, don't forget, the closing night reception on the end of the last day, you've got to come. Take your badges, you're going to drop them in a bucket, and there's going to be a drawing for an iPad. But you must be present to win. And I thought, you must be present to win. That is showtime. How many times have we signed up for a raffle or a drawing, and there on the back, must be present to win? It's true. We must be present to win in life, at work, in relationships, at the table with our families, presenting at a board meeting, showing up to work, or going up to make our coffee order in the morning. We must be present to win. Now, sometimes that's tougher to, to do than actually say, and that's because in our lives we've got economic worries, political struggles, violence and, 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 and health issues and, and craziness all around us and schedules that we can't keep straight. We're picking up and we're dropping off. Sometimes we look back and we think, boy, wasn't there a simpler time that we could be present without all the distractions? And I look back to 1884 when the incredible artist George Seurat gave us a beautiful painting a Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grangeat. Oh, I love this painting. And when you look at it, you can always put yourself on that island and you can hear the oars slicing through that water. You can see and hear those children playing. You can smell the flowers that they're picking. And yes, you even notice that that woman with the umbrella seems to be walking a monkey. That's what I see in 1884 when you put yourself into that painting. It's been updated this year by a Korean artist, Kim Dung Kyu. And what this artist did was bring this painting a Sunday afternoon up to what they thought it would be like in 2013. Again, if you put yourself in that picture, and you can listen, and what do we hear? Yep, that's the sound. That's our Sunday afternoon on the island. And that's a sound we hear often on many Sunday afternoons in the park or on the lake, walking down the street in our homes, in our churches, in the middle of the sermon. And it's tough because I wonder if the people in this painting of today heard the children playing or smelled the flowers that they picked or looked up at that beautiful blue sky and green trees. I wonder if they looked up at all. I had a New Year's resolution this year. It was simple but tough to accomplish. It was to look up to look up from my handheld, not check emails during conversations, not to touch base during meetings, but to look up and see the surroundings. Pass people, eye and look, pass people by and look them in the eye and say hello. In fact, I was at the airport yesterday. There was a man in a beautiful suit. 
He had headphones in. He was looking down at his smartphone, walking down the terminal and right into the women's bathroom. <laughs> and I said, buddy, hey, buddy, buddy. He couldn't hear me because the headphones were in. Well, a few moments later, he walked out of that women's room, embarrassed and looking up. But you know, technology is not to blame. Technology is the innovation that saves lives, that bridges our world and communities. It's the traits that we develop as we use the technology. You know, with technology, it's been said, comes responsibility. And that's true. But we also have a responsibility to the present a responsibility to preserve the present. You know, we have a choice in life. We can choose if we want to simply go through the motions or phone it in, professionally or personally, or we can live showtime as our time. Because when we're present, we have more value we are more valuable to our companies, to organizations, to our families, in our relationships, and to ourselves. We must be present to win because we cannot afford to miss a moment. And I say to you in this room sitting here at TED, to all the people watching on the web and living around the world. It's here. It's invented right now around all of us, within all of us. And that is the present. Ladies and gentlemen, it's showtime and it's your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.